how do you feel about this? Welcome, everybody, to Star Trek, 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 our ongoing journey through the episode of Star Trek. We have a special guest. Marie has joined us for what we're going to do a couple of Enterprise episodes going forward, the Enterprise Instant, and then you'll see soon in a couple of weeks uh, we'll be doing the Shadows of the Gem. But you are a Shran fan, as it were. Did you just uh, call this the Enterprise Ensign? It's called the Andorian Incident. Yeah, that, that too. Um, no, the Enterprise incident was the the TOS one, wasn't it? But Marie, anyway, less about us. Um, why? What, what's what's your fascination with with Strand Enterprise? What draws you to this theme? The boyfriends, as stars would call them. <laughs> um, I I guess to me, um, he's one of the characters that seems to. He doesn't need as much development to me as a lot of the other characters do. Like, he kind of comes in already pretty developed. Everyone mm. else needs to kinda reach that level gradually to me. Um, but I'm also like, Enterprise wasn't my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> um, the here and there that were good. There was a, a good few times with um, the character chemistry was really good. Um, but it just felt like it took a little longer to kind of get up to there than some of the other shows did. Hmm. Um, but I don't know. I I I, I like Coons. <laughs> I really like Wayoon. Hmm. I was like, oh, plays a character in this. Okay, <laughs> well, maybe watch it for him. <laughs> um, but I don't know. I I like watching a little more of it. I'm like, okay, I really like the character. Let me go and find out a little bit about the race, and that's did my research for that and then ended up making a character for the tabletop who <laughs> ends up being one of my favorites actually oh wow how have i not seen a wayoon's world parody at this point by oh the way oh my god I feel like that's so <laughs> easy <laughs> 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 um party on andorian <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, we just finished watching the Andorian Incident, uh, which is the debut of um, Shran, paid by one, yes, Jeffrey Coombs, uh, and also the introduction of the Andorian Vulcan plotline uh, for Enterprise. And we, we were just we were just actually saying, beginning of the episodes, like, oh my god, we're now getting some good Star Trek episodes under us. And this was, I, I felt good about this one. Guys, how did you, yeah, how did you feel? Go for it. Dude, this was so much better. Mm. Even then, I, re I remember being good. This is like an all-time great episode. And, you know, maybe I'm overselling it because we came off this string of really bad ones. Yeah. But, like, the pacing was great. It was it was a, it was a gradual but steady build. Uh, you know, Archer in his role, you know, we bash him a lot for being this or that. Another captain would not have worked there. Another captain wouldn't have asked questions at the start, uh, you know, when they're in the sanctuary. Another captain wouldn't have... A shoulder past the, uh, the 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 double agent Vulcan at the end to go find the transmitter. Like Jane, Janeway would not have worked in this. Maybe even Cisco. Mm. Yeah, you know, maybe Kirk would. He was very Kirk in this episode. But so he played his role well. We had the junior varsity squad on the ship. Everyone got some lines there. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the Andorians. You know, this is kind of their reintroduction to to the Star Trek consciousness. So they did give them a little bit of characterization, probably not as much as that, you know, they're, they're angry and they're blue. That's actually kind of what we got. <laughs> they could have gone a little further there, but we get to see duplicitous Vulcans. Um, and I'll touch on that a little, a little later. Some people weren't happy that they're like, Oh, they're showing Vulcans line. It's like, no, we, you know, they're not a monolith there. There's some stuff there. So this was great. We had some great directorial flair with, I, I think Roxanne Dawson does this Indeed, one. Yes. Uh, uh, no, it's also directing. When we're done with the cold open. Yeah. Uh, Go known, ahead. Her direction also known for Vox Sola. And also, she's Bellana Taurus. Um, but she did a, a few other things. This is uh, the story itself was by Shush Windows. Uh, was done by Fred Decker, who also did Sleeping Dogs, uh, Sleeping Dogs, and Vox Sola. Uh, he was also a consultant producer on a lot of Enterprise episodes as well. So there's a bit of a, a sort of running theme. If this feels like you know, it, this episode feels like you know, if you're going to put the essential Enterprise episodes together for kind of that you know, building the Federation vibe, this is sort of one of them. And I feel I feel like he was sort of a part of that kind of singes and I, i've remarked as well before but this kind of feels like the first episode where you kind of feel like it coming into a more of its hole a little bit and it, they basically explicitly call some of that out too in in the dialogue they mm. start with trip and archer talking about you know the star charts and they, they kind of wish they didn't have them so they could be true explorers 
And then, yeah, they're dipping their toes into interstellar affairs. Mm. They're basically making doctrine as they go, um, you know, with Archer deciding to give the Andorians. That is sort of, I, we talked about it earlier, like, you know, TOS, early Star Trek, the captain is the law out there. Because he's the only one, you know, we can't phone home all the time. He's making the decisions. He decides, basically, uh, you know, uh, international um, affairs. You know, if, if they'd have called home, I'm sure for, it was forced. the guy at this mm. point. He would have been like, no, no, we have to placate the Vulcans, you know, just do what they say. And and he decides to, um, to basically, well, to give the information to the Andorians, and that, that ends up coming back in a big way down the line. Drawing, the, You know, I don't think they would have joined the Federation if not for this episode. This is sort of where that branches out into their whole relationship there. So I realize I'm like talking over you guys. I, I actually really enjoyed this episode. There's so much in there that paved the way that did a lot of good stuff. I appreciated uh, the fact that everybody in this episode got a chance to have a multifacet to them. Um, I wasn't expecting that. Except Mayweather. No. Well, poor Mayweather. Poor Mayweather. He that that's not going to change. Spoilers. But uh, uh, you know, I think that I would. I really enjoyed seeing the partnership between Archer and Tip uh, Trip on on the planet. Just you know, when they just immediately knew how to handle the situation and how to do their little bumbling uh, two act <laughs> down there. And and it was just you know we did this we done this before. We know how to work these guys over. They're a bunch of chumps. And. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We've run this con before. Um, They're just the ultimate yeah. Starfleet grifters, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. And and just like so, I mean, our, going into this, our impression of Vulcans has been unimpeachable, and so now we get to see a, a different side of of how maybe how they were, or even how they are, and they've just gotten better at hiding it. Um, and and also the Andorians, and, and that's the masterstroke in casting Jeffrey Coombs as as uh, as Shran is he can pull up both sides of that, and he can turn on a dime, and he does it in this episode, and it's great to see. Um, I do have an issue with the pacing. Most of the episode takes place in a bedroom in a lobby, and two full segments we just get poor Archer just getting walloped on, <laughs> and I felt like that was a little bit much, you know, pat padding out the episode with with severe beatings. But uh, <laughs> he got uh, he definitely got hit a lot in the small of the back ear, didn't he? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I was I was also concerned. So they did they did kind of drop at the end of the episode that somewhere out there is the Andorian's vessel, and I thought for sure that the NCIS B squad up in the the, the ship would be able to. <laughs> Would be able to like find like part of their job would be to find this other vessel, use some mm. gunboat diplomacy, draw them out that way instead of having to go into a sensitive situation on the planet. But I guess that's what 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 differentiated this was, you know, getting people onto the planet, boots on the ground, and having Reed get something to do early on. So see, the, the um, Andorians were hanging in the magnetic the, the polar orbit, so they couldn't <laughs> be scanned, and, oh, and that's why they were yeah. Have they have they dropped that on lower decks yet? Oh, the first place you check is the polar orbit. There's a, they're always in the polar <laughs> orbit, right? <laughs> yeah, they they should. Okay. Marie, we've been talking. What were your thoughts? Um, I quite enjoyed it. I mean, yeah, I I do kind of get with the pacing being where you are pretty much just in a room the whole time. Um, there's I find there's not too many like shows or movies that can be located in one area the whole way through and be super, super entertaining. I think this comes with, like, I, I don't want to say that it doesn't, but it does have some parts that it could have maybe done a little more with. Like, I would have liked seeing more of them planning. I would have liked seeing maybe um, a little more, maybe kickback from the, like, Vulcans back and forth. Like, Fourth, not just the oh you can't mess with the you got um, a problem or something like I I don't know I, I expected a little a little bit like more from from that than oh su surprise we finally got down here and there we we were lying the whole time I <laughs> I, I don't know I, I I thought some of the parts where it was um the big like twist and stuff they would have settled on a little bit longer um I don't know it it, it for being um. Enterprise, it is um, one of the better, much better episodes to me. Um, <laughs> I thought, you know, they didn't they didn't have too many sets, but I thought actually they made a concerted effort to tie it in. It starts with Archer when he first gets slugged a couple times. They go to shaky cam, like you see his point of view, and then you see they sort of try to detail his thought process. He looks over at the giant face, and that's when it's like first revealed. 
And then later, you know, we get like the, the three dots where they explain that it's the eyes and the mouth, the light coming through that. We have him throw the little figurine in there to, to, to signal to trip. All right, this is where, and then they blow out with explosives at the end. So they do like five or six things to try to tie in the space. Like this is where it's connected to the, the catacombs and everything. So I, you know, it is a little claustrophobic. Maybe it's meant to be, uh, but they do actually quite a lot of groundwork to, to try to tie in the other set pieces. Then the CGI thing at the end, like there's only so much you can do with that giant transmitter room. So I feel like the face they were trying to, to make a point about uh, the Vulcans and the facade. But I was just really surprised when they went when they went to the bottom of the the cavern behind the face, and there was not like wadded up Taco Bell wrappers down there. Or just, I mean, like it's just begging. <laughs> Dude, there was a big American tourist vibe here. Oh, like, God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, down in Colorado, he's coming up with his Joe Piscopo impressions as well as he's giving his comedy routine to the Andorians. That was so that funny. That was so Shatner in the best way. I love that really writing. Was. You could actually, yeah, you could very rightly transpose this into TOS and you wouldn't notice a single difference. Like, this is... And again, Janeway and Cisco, they can't do that. Like, they're yeah. a little bit too uptight, a little bit too, not even by the book, but it's like, they couldn't, they couldn't, Make make themselves play the fool and, Cisco, and take the beating for. Has Cisco ever been? Has ever? Has he ever sat and taken a beating? Oh, I suppose duet with Duke out. I suppose he has, but that's a quite entirely different context. But would, he's never been the one in front of a group of people saying, "Tell me your secrets," and he's like, "No." Yeah, no. He he prefers genocide from a distance. He doesn't really get, get in there and mix one it up. One time, with guys. It was one time. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it was a small seven billion lies. Who cares? How many times does it take, Idol? <laughs> how many lives admiral um yeah no i i i think for the pacing issues it's it, it flows faster than you think like there are moments you're just like okay let's let's see where they're going with this and yeah they do give archer more beatings than he probably needs well maybe um but uh it, it it did move at a decent enough pace and i feel like there was enough you know this is an action episode it's sort of like action slash political drama isn't it really and there are enough moments between you know trip and archer sort of bowling over the guy that's very badly hidden behind this you know the, the screen door which has all the holes in it he's just like Ugh. um and between that and this, this sort of the the last action piece at the end that it was engaging enough yeah that was a little bit panto just having the endorian crouching behind there i'm a creepy little endorian i hope they don't see me <laughs> yeah that part i thought was very quirk like them just knocking that thing over I'm like oh that's tos <laughs> yeah like daytime saturday tv kind of just like buddy cop duo just like the criminals behind it let's get him you know but you know once they reveal it via reflection i almost kind of wish they tried to like bank a phaser shot off the vase and then like around the corner and hit the guy with that but they went with the uh, yeah the keystone cops moment instead <laughs> uh, before we get off the pacing too much i guess shout out paul belargion sorry if i butchered her name paul uh, I love this guy as as he writes he's written uh, let me check the credits here about about 40 music credits Enterprise Voyager and DS9 um War Adagio is the name of the track from uh Siege of AR558 that might be my favorite Star Trek music of all time he ha he definitely has a, a a style so if you listen to several back to back you'd get it but I actually think it helped the pacing his music like it, it jumps out to me as as uh, you know, usually you don't want to notice the music. You want it to just build emotion without you. And but so I did notice it, but it wasn't it wasn't distracting. Mm. It wasn't a bad thing. So shout it out, was, shout out to him. It was, yeah, it was a little sort of atypical. You know, they're wandering through the tomb full of mummies, so you get the pan pipes and you get the kind of the mystical music and the action. But yeah, it was it it it, it was there for the sort of the theming of the episode. I think definitely there is a with any of the UPN Star Trek stuff, there was an inference behind the scenes, just like, just stay in your lane. Just, you stay there. So why they kick Ron Jones out of like the early TNG moments, because he was just getting, he's like, I found all these synthesizers and I'm going to play them all at once. And that's going to be the <laughs> Borg's theme song. I'm like, no, get out. <laughs> so yeah, there's a slight difference. So uh, my question is, does this, I mean, so this is clearly a pivotal moment and it's opening up the, the long arc for, for a lot of what's to come. Um, we we know that we're going into a, a part two, a follow uh, not a part two, but a follow up episode. So does mm. does this does the pacing get forgiven, knowing that we're we're moving into a sequel here? Is this uh, does this episode earn a follow up? Is there enough here to warrant that? I think so. I mean, 
usually to go and set up something, it's going to take a little bit longer. You got to add some extra details. You got to um, generate some mystery that you want to discover for the next part. Um, so yeah, I definitely think at least um, when you consider that there is a part two, essentially that the pacing, like it makes a little more, more sense. Mm-hmm. Um, even some stuff still a little secretive also makes more sense. They are like, okay, we'll dig more onto that later. Um, we gotta just give you this little nugget first. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, definitely. I like how they stuff. threw in some hints of the, and I won't call it racism because to Paul's reaction to the humans is more visceral. You know, she has a, uh, you know, her body reacts in a certain way that's beyond her control when, when she's around humans and she suppresses it because Vulcan, that, that's what Vulcans do. Um, but that shows just there's there's something more to the relationship than just, you know, hey, we're, we're helping out, we, you know, we're being the babysitters. You know, we, we mentioned multiple times they, they think of the humans as, as toddlers in, in much, uh, in, in much of the same ways. And, um, the I think the 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 best part of the episode was seeing her being completely comfortable, uh, just taking the blanket from from Archer and just knowing that hey you know I, I know where this relationship really is and you can be my commander and and I'm here in a certain capacity but but we all know who's running the show here. I, I'm probably going to save um, my one of my favorite moments is a Topol moment but just to sort of mention I would have loved to have like he turns around usually hey um if you know if like the arch is talking to her and she has her back to him and just is like I've not had my nasal suppressant in 24 hours and she turns around she's just like veins are bulging her eyes are like bloodshot and just like start tweaking out it's like I can't take it I can't take the smell she's got a <laughs> chunk of celery shoved up each nostril and... <laughs> yeah <laughs> anything all right here's my segue speaking of celery I actually loved who doesn't love flocks but at the beginning, mm. T'Pol is talking about her discomfort, and in just this brilliant, subtle way, Flox illustrates his point by so reaching good, over, yeah. grabbing her celery. He's not a dummy. He knows what he's doing. He knows it's going to tick her off. He's tweaking her just a little bit. You, you know, T'Pol, you might have to exit your comfort zone a little bit if you're on a ship with like 150 humans and, and we're the only aliens. So I love the little the celery grab, and then, you know, he asks her... Uh, uh, um, rhetorically it's like oh, did you want this back she's like no you can keep it so uh i like that moment and i gotta back up i have to i take great offense to the phrase uh how did you word it the the issues with the pacing the problem with the pacing i i liked the pacing <laughs> but to answer your question about a follow-up you can't do that ending where he gives critical data to a third party because you know before this a lot of enterprise has been a build-up between humans and vulcans and so to turn around and give critical uh, tactical information to the Vulcan's greatest enemy, it's like you can't not do a follow-up at that mm-hmm. point. Plus, I think in Star Trek, they love doing the, pardon my French, the the ass-chewing scene. Like you just know some admiral is going to get on the horn and yell at Archer for doing this. So yeah, there has to be some kind of follow-up. Uh, so, you know, pacing aside, that's, I think they knew going in there was going to be some kind of payoff, some kind of build up to that. But they didn't have to write the ending that way. I mean, they could have. I mean, sure. they they framed the Andorians as being violent. The Andorians could have just blown the damn place up, and you know everybody escapes by the skin of their teeth. There's a detonator charge, and they've got to get off the planet. You know, there's a number of ways they could have wrapped it up and just kind of left it as a, a dangling thread to pick up sometime later. Um, you know, they didn't necessarily have to go that way. I'm glad they did. It's a lot more interesting. Uh, but that's a more typical Trek response to see. You know, the the violent Klingons wouldn't have ever done that. So it, at least it helps to paint paint the blue guys a little bit differently than the red guys it's interesting because there's not a lot to the andorians in this episode like you say they're, they're portrayed as violent and then you get creepy andorian for no real reason which is just yeah like, he was need you creepy. to hate this one character for no real reason yeah, that was it good was though that was good it worked but why <laughs> it's my it, main was, it was good it was good in a gross way like n- not everyone has to be uh evil in a, in a certain hmm. mold like, didn't you just watching that? Didn't it make your skin crawl? He's like, I horrible. could kill someone for you. Does that turn you on to Paul? And it's like, oh, this guy's a total creeper. And yeah. so, you know, as long as it elicits emotion, I like that. Yeah, I think it's just more kind of just sort of like we're trying to portray, like, we're not quite sure. When we know the grander scope of things, Andoria joins the Federation, everyone's buddies, hey, they're a bit of a funny race, but whatever. Um, yeah, everyone has their differences, but the, in this context, they're kind of not really portraying the Andorians as any one thing. That, you know, you don't really get that cause for sympathy. Like, Shran's just like, I know they've got something here, I just know it. But they don't. There's, you're not kind of getting that sympathetic angle going, 
well, the payoff for giving the Andorians the intelligence, I'm not quite sure if I'm feeling like, why well, Archer does that very suddenly. It's like, oh, give it to them, rather than just sort of like, you know nothing about them. They've just beaten the shit out of you. Why are you doing this? Well, so here's the thing. These guys are the goon squad of Andoria. Hmm. They establish, they swing by every few months, they kick around some hapless Vulcans, and then they leave. So, like, that's their, their shtick. This is not a, 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 uh, a first contact, no. you know, diplomatic team that they're sending. They were there to break some pots and, and knock some heads together. And so that being our first, yeah, like I said, I, I would have liked a little more characterization, but in story, they established that they're only there to, to, to rough up the Vulcans. So I think it's fine that they're not like established diplomats. <laughs> Over time I said, give it to them. I've taken multiple beatings today. That's my optimal operating condition. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to, I'm sure I'm going to get a hang on a minute in a minute. Oh no, 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 no. Can I move on? No. I do have a couple more notes. Okay, if, go for it. Are we going into you... our, our wrap it up pl- structured segment? No, 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 it's fine. We can go a bit of bread in there if you like. But, uh... <laughs> no, no. We're sa- we're That's not going to mix the streams. All right. Two tiny notes. Caval. Uh, he, he calls the guy Caval and then like throws him a phaser or whatever. I love it. I mentioned it when we were watching along. It's like you could have just said, hey, you, or you didn't even need to call him out. They gave some random guy a name, and I just like that it's a tiny little... It's a it's a melon baller of, of world building, so good for them. Uh, and then at the end, when they're in the phaser fight, right before they they pull, they reveal the giant X Men door. And, and, <laughs> yes, repurpose uh, from the last. They're doing, stand. A little, <laughs> they're doing a little phaser fighting, and in addition to the normal sparks flying off, they're like breaking pots. They have practical effects of of like destruction of of items in the world building that makes it you know it sells the power of the phaser. So I like that they went a little farther than just like sparks or or uh, cgi stuff now you can any other business <laughs> um i had a couple um i was kind of i kind of thought there would be more um maybe not necessarily more done but for their like honored dead they just have them leaning against the wall yeah i thought that was kind of <laughs> odd choice and like they're not like in a more dignified place they're just up against the wall <laughs> uh, i was like that's kind of funny and also the um to even enter the catacombs is a secret door that's kind of blended in i'm kind of surprised the main door leading to the big antenna would wouldn't also kind of look the same <laughs> that's big put a carpet door. over it'll be fine okay. <laughs> yeah. put a, put a blanket over i'm like a throw you, rug you covered up the other door well enough you didn't think to cover up this one too okay <laughs> Sure, it's just kind of weird choices to me. Mm. But All right. in in honor of our dearly departed friend Stars and Garters, we miss you, buddy. I'm gonna I'm gonna play his role, and because I it always irritates me, he justifies everything that they didn't justify in the show. But I'm gonna do it this time. I think, and I'm I'm almost certainly reaching here. This was a temple for worship and contemplation, and colon the purging of emotions is like the heart of Vulcan. They they basically defiled their dead. They're turning it into a giant spy satellite. So for them to r- remove these bodies and kind of leave them strewn around, actually, I think is consistent with the fact they're disgracing what 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 they should be doing, like the correct, proper being a Vulcan, and and so the fact that they choose they they choose to to turn their back on that, and then yeah, they just have this disregard for the bodies. I think it actually matches the characterization of. Of their actions there, so I'm definitely reading too much into it, but I forgive it because of that. Don't you pajem splain us? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's go on to our best and worst moment. Since you are honoured guest this week, please step into our temple and tell us what your favourite and worst moments were, please, Marie. Um, it, I don't know. There's. It was a lot of pretty much everything was kind of keeping at the same um, level, but I guess the only thing I could point out as being the worst was just that creepy part <laughs> with the inter- <laughs> Just I was like, yeah, that wasn't necessary. I get you're trying to do a bit of like, okay, here's like some added, um, some, like added issues and like added danger and stuff. I'm like, oh, that wasn't necessary. <laughs> I'm like, that's, like that's just creepy. Just be creepy. Um, and my favorite part's probably going to be small just because it, it almost seemed just, just made me laugh that they could have done any other thing. 
the them just knocking over that wall to go and get the guy. <laughs> like you could have done any other thing. Like you had technically the jump on him, could have done any other thing, and you guys still technically lost that little fight, <laughs> even though you had the jump on him. But I'm like, okay, I don't know that part just kind of made me um, honestly made me chuckle. So it's just a couple small things. Yeah. Uh, done. So best moment for me is is going back to the beginning of the episode with uh, with Doctor Flux and Topol sitting at the table, and we stop short just short of him mentioning that after he takes the celery and and asks for permission, he takes and dumps it into whatever pile of gruelish looking <laughs> salmon row he's eating, and just takes a big hearty chomp and is dripping <laughs> off into his lap, and is just like I I drink your milkshake, Topol. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, worst moment was the the kind of the hokey bit where he's you know Scott Bakula is baculating and he's getting his <laughs> butt kicked and he's getting knocked all over the foyer and then he just and it was more more the more the cinematography than anything but it just looks so obvious with him throwing the little thing down the the mouth of the thing and it just you know, that could have been a little bit better to me so you kind know in Canton Ohio he's <laughs> giving all these these Wikipedia <laughs> trivia bits I love them. <laughs> Can I can I just now put in for any exaggerated speech? It's not a Shatnerism now. This is going to be to back. He baculated everywhere. Like, baculated. Is... <laughs> okay. No, well. no, because then someone's going to say premature evaculation, and we're going to have to cancel. <laughs> no, cancel you're doing the it. Entire show. <laughs> you're you're so doing it. Let's not go down that. <laughs> Too late. Uh, uh, uh. Um, auto. Yeah, I wait till Marie's on to be real classy. Uh, sorry about that. All right, my best moment, and sorry guys, you know, you won't agree with me. I enjoyed the pacing. I enjoyed Paulie B and his music. I thought it built nicely. Uh, the scene at the beginning, a couple, I, I liked the early scenes. Trip and, and Archer talking about, you know, we're taking our first steps. I like that. And then the, the, the T'Pol and Flock scene, that's just a little playful thing. And then we beam down, we build from there. There's a little bit of tension, a little bit of mystery. What happened when they bashed the door in? And then we start to build, the music builds, we get a few beating the crap out of Bacula scenes, escalates into firefights, and then the big climax at the end. So I actually thought they built it really well. Um, my worst part, and this is probably because I, I'm just coming out, I, I rewatched season three and four recently, but Tripp actually had almost no characterization beyond his accent. Mm. And I thought he played a lot of things pretty flat Maybe just compared to season three and four trip, but you know, for someone who's supposed to be one of the, the big three, like the Bone, Spock, and McCoy, you know, it's Archer, Trip, and T'Pol. He kind he came across as pretty flat to me uh, and didn't do much. Red alarm! The Red stone. alarm! Red alarm! Sorry, thank you, Lockyer Mavonatrinity. I can't even say that. Thank you for following. That was really good. Yeah. That's better than I could do. <laughs> uh, yeah, so so Trip was my worst. Okay. Idol, what about you? I really loved early on the episode where you know um, Archer and Trip are just gloating, is like, ah, Vulcans didn't uh, didn't find this star system. Let's invite the Vulcan in to rub a face in it. But no, I really appreciated uh, Jolene Blalock's acting in this episode because it's hard to mm -hmm. act in a Vulcan and look pissed off at the same time. But she managed it in that early episode where there's like, well, the Vulcans didn't find this, and she's just like, you're going to come down to one of our holiest ceremonial places. You're going to go down there like the dumbass toddlers you are. And I'm going to have to show you our routine ceremonies and you're just going to cause trouble. And you can see it. She's just standing there like stoically and you can just see like every moment of like, oh fuck, this is going to happen in her face. And I think I really like that. I like, you know, okay, uh, Tr Tucker's got his shit eating grin on and he's just like, ah, I'm just winding her up. But like, you can just sort of see like her playing towards, they're both playing towards each other's strengths in that episode. And I, I really liked sort of to pull in that. My worst moment? I don't know. I would have liked more of Shran in this. I feel like you could have, like, okay, we had, um, like, he's, he's we, you know, you're getting Jeffrey Coombs in. He has a lesser role in this than I remember, actually. He's somewhat of the antagonist until the final moments, but you have more sort of inference on that creepy Andorian who, you know, tries to sort of intimidate T'Pol with his weird fetishes. Um, and also, like, you know, we need more sort of... I want I want more motivation from Shran. I need to know more why he's there other than just like, I've got to find it. Why have you got to find it? Are you under direction from your government? Do you have a personal stake in this? Do you, I just like a little bit more character development other than Blue Antagonist, which unfortunately that's kind of what he was in this episode. Um... I want to piggyback on, on your best moment because there was actually a, a moment uh, that Jolene gave us that, that stood out right at the end where they're inside the CGI 
picture. And Archer turns to her and says, you know, take a recording. And she has this, it's almost like an ashamed look on her face. She's like ashamed on behalf of the mm-hmm. Vulcans that they would do this. Uh, and I thought that was a nice moment that, that she gave us. Oh, also the glass-jawed Vulcan, who was just the most <laughs> lamest Vulcan in all of Star Trek, just holding that gun, just like, I'll protect it. Like, no, you won't. And then just gets knocked out by Archer. Like, no, what are you doing, mate? If it wasn't Archer, it was going to be one of the other guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a cue. It's like I've seen an airplane. He's just sitting in this coffee seat like, no, let me have a go at him. Uh, okay. I hope one of you's got a wonderful rating because Stars isn't here to give it this. Ooh. So put your thinking caps on. Dan's with us. Right, Dan, what have we got for this episode? What is our rating criteria? So for this episode, we're going to be rating on how many rapidly fading Vulcan nasal numbing agents out of 10. <laughs> like it, like it. <laughs> nasal numbing agents out of 10. Okay. Uh, Marie, what is your rating? Um... It is better than I remember because I was just, just like, okay, which one is this? I think it's this one. But I remember so few details because it's been a good, like, at least over, possibly over a year so since I saw it. <laughs> um, so I'd probably up my initial rating. Um, let's see. I'd probably go um, with uh, eight rapidly um, fading nomination set of <laughs> <laughs> up a little bit uh go on Dan. uh well yeah i i really give them credit they they went places with this episode they had the courage to change up a lot of what we really believed about the vulcans as being uh honest and forthright and now we find out that they've you know uh, created some listening posts and probably necessarily so but it raises questions about whether to pull is just you know some eyes of a secret arm of a Section 31 Tal Shiar type, you know, <laughs> evil espionage. It was group. old man Surak um, all along. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you can you can raise questions about the nitty gritty of it, but the overall direction was great. Roxanne Dawson, uh, Belana Torres did, did a fantastic job directing the episode. Everything about it was watchable. It was interesting. And I'm excited for what's coming next. I raised to an eight also. Oh, wow. Rapidly fading Vulcan nasal numbing agents. Rapidly fading. Uh, auto. Uh, Idly, you go ahead. Oh my word! Deferring to me, I. You know what? I'm. I'm going to follow the trend here. What did I give? I gave it an eight point five. I'm going to stick to an eight point five. I think I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was good television. There are a few hokey moments, but once you, I think th- you appreciate this more once you've watched all of Enterprise and you realise that's Archer. That's just what he is like. This is <laughs> there is there is a note on some admiral's desk somewhere that like that. Yeah, this is just Archer. Like this is we we've got the exception for his hokey causes, but um, apart from that and the, the creepy creepy Andorian, I I thoroughly enjoyed it. Like there was enough here. I love how it expands the wider world of Enterprise, and you realise oh. This is the start of starting to form the Federation. This is the start of, like, a few little plot lines that they do kind of deliver on, you know, especially coming into season four when, the, yeah, that's our art. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and they, uh, you know, they come to season like. So I, I like how this is the kind of the episode where you realise that, like, oh, okay, they're not just, you know, Andorians are not just going to be this one-hit wonder. We're probably going to see some more from them again. So, yeah, 8.5 8. Uh, rapidly fading nasal numbing agents from me. <laughs> I was going to yell at you if you didn't include it, so good for you. Uh, I swear I know how to read a room, but I just don't care. This is 9.8 rapidly fading nasal numbing agents out of 10. Like I said, I watched season three and four, and so that's fresh. There's exactly one episode in that two-season stretch that I think is on par with this observer effect. So Mm, I'm looking forward to, to, to talking about that one. And so just, I think with that bit of context makes me more sure of, of that rating. This is an absolutely great episode. There's not a single scene that I don't like. There's, there are elements within certain scenes I don't like, but on their own, I liked every single scene in this. And all the things that this that Trek Trek is training us to notice, uh, directorial choices, mm. bits of music and stuff, all the things that stand out, stand out because of a good reason. Nothing seems clunky. Nothing seems... Uh, unsmooth as you go through it uh, to me I do, so yeah this is a great episode I love w- uh, what I try to get into I probably still can't uh, uh, put it in, into words perfectly but that the sort of element of the, the three races and 
humanity kind of elbowing their way into this dynamic now. Uh, that puts them in the driver's seat because the Vulcans have to deal with them now. And Doria has to deal with them now. They're emerging onto the universal, the global stage. Uh, and that's sort of a, a, a seminal moment for humanity as a whole. And to think that Archer is like the reason that it happened is kind of funny because for all the shtick that he gets, he was the right captain for, for this incident. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and this episode knocks it out of the park, so 9.8. Awesome. Well, that brings this episode an average of 8.6, one of our highest rated uh, so far, especially the most rated of Enterprise as well, takes it up to... Mm -hmm. We gave Ad Astra per Aspera, we gave that an 8.7. We gave Yesterday Year an 8.5, so that's the ballpark we're in now. It's definitely one of our highest rated non-Strange New Worlds episodes because we pretty much gave all of Strange New Worlds a 10 out of 10. We're not going to lie. Um, but... So are you, saying, are you saying that Strange New Worlds, the animated series, and Star Trek Enterprise are our three top rated episodes Absolutely. so far? Absolutely. You know what? Right I on. probably think they are now. <laughs> Let me have That's a fantastic. Look. Actually, I need to, I haven't got, have I got that breakdown? Nearly got that breakdown. I haven't quite got it yet. But... Oh, actually, no, yeah, Enterprise is a 6.4, Strange New Worlds is an 8.0, oh, so actually, I don't know, we rate a Voyager higher, but it's number three. Um, anyway, uh, that takes Star Trek to a 6.4, it's going up, the ratings are going up, we're getting there. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's shooting at the rankings, but anyway, thank you, Marie, for joining us this week. If you are on stream, stick about, we're going to watch the follow-up Shadows of Pajem, we're going to switch the order up a little bit so we can hit this two-part of where it, where it belongs, um, and if you're watching us, join us in two weeks four shadows of a gem so we'll see you then check the discord hopefully we had some twilight zone stuff uploaded now it is june i think or july if we haven't uploaded it by now what are we doing? i think we're done with the series <laughs> oh no no anyway we're gonna uh, finish on a song though we're gonna finish on the song <laughs> i've got small of the back knowing where that gun will hit me oh god someone, oh, he's, he's baculating again <laughs> anyway we'll see you later live long and proper <laughs> goodbye <laughs>